Video games are my life. Being a video game addict is better than being a crack whore. Your mom is on the cover! I think. But make no mistake about it, it's still an addiction. One that puts our cognitive, tactical, puzzle-solving, or hand-eye coordination talents to the test. One that takes us to interesting places, regales us with fascinating music, and leaves us memorable moments. But an addiction nonetheless. Some of the games that we play are much more to blame for our addiction than others, though. And sometimes, just when we are in that phase of... InRide's good guy developer to give us exactly what we craved. Not just more of the same, but better of the same. Better action, better stories, less of what we didn't like, and a truckload more of what we did. And today we are here to celebrate those who hit that nail we call expansion packs on the head. Or DLCs if you were born when the internet was already a thing. But if you have been following along, you know that in this channel, when it comes to lists, we have rules, you know? And here are the ones that we will be using this time. First, no stacking. Because some of these sagas were like Phil Collins in the 80s with their expansion packs. They just couldn't stop making hits. So in those cases, we're going to be choosing the best DLC in the saga. Second, we're going to be keeping things in our turf for this list. And that means that only RPGs and RPG-ish games will be considered. So the Knife of Dunwall slash the Brigmore Witches for Dishonored and Blood Dragon for Far Cry 3, as awesome as they were, so fucking Awesome. We'll have to sit this one out. Third, I am going to be cheating, so don't go bitching about it in the comment section. Or do, whatever rocks your boat. Fourth, only expansions that add several hours of gameplay with new locations or new missions or new playable characters will be considered. So no weapon packs, cosmetics, armored horses, or some such similar bullshit will be taken into account. Fifth, no fan-made DLC-sized mods will be considered for this list. So yes, you can forget about the Forgotten City, Moonpath to Elsewhere, or Enderal the Shards of Order for Skyrim. But unofficially, maybe go check those out. Sixth, this is a personal list and if you don't like it, fuck your mama! Uh, sorry, that was not the right clip for that movie. Thank you very much. There you go. So let's get this fucking party started with a few rapid fire honorable mentions. Reaper of Souls, Diablo 3. Because fixing shit that was broken and turning utterly disappointing shit into something decent also matters. Blood Moon, Morrowind. An expansion pack that grabbed everything that was right about the core game, as little as that was threw in some mad difficulty and a more streamlined quest, which is exactly what this game needed. Eternal Embers, Titan Quest. To be fair, this is not the best DLC that has come out for Titan Quest, but just how fucking awesome is a game that came out in the year 2007 and got an expansion pack in the year 2017 and another one in the year 2021. Seriously guys, this is the perfect excuse to dust off this timeless classic. The Burning Crusade, World of Warcraft. More a full-fleshed game than an expansion, really. This first expansion pack for World of Warcraft took things to an insane level of addiction, just when we were all like, <laughs> with the core game, Warband, Mountain Blade. Damn it, this game only needs a campaign to become one of the best games ever created. Ah, yes, that's the thing. And that new javelin mechanic? So fucking awesome. So here are our top 10 picks. Artorias of the Abyss, Dark Souls. So I finally found a fucking way to enter this place and it was totally worth it. This is Dark Souls living up to its full potential. Why? Because there is a baby Sif that you have to save, of course. And you could also mention the four new bosses, which admittedly are a nightmare for a night cheeser like myself. But I imagine the good good Dark Souls crowd got their money's worth tenfold. Because believe me, there is no cheesing any of these guys. Next to Artorias or Black Dragon Karameet, bosses like Smaug and Ornstein feel like they are mentally and physically impaired. The AIs and these guys seem like it came from another From Softer game from far in the future, and it truly requires you to crank up your skills to the next level. I found the locations in the core game to be much more inspired than anything we saw in this DLC, but that's just me trying to find something to crap on. This is a love letter to fans of the core game and to anyone who appreciates a developer who takes their target audience seriously. The White March Part 2, Pillars of Eternity. The White March is a two-part expansion pack. The first part was relatively unimpressive. It featured somewhat clunky writing and on the gameplay end of things, it was more of the same. But the second part did what every timeless expansion has ever done. It grabbed everything that was good about the core game and cranked it up to 11 and fixed everything that wasn't quite right. How dare you say that there was stuff that wasn't quite 
much right than the original pillars. Hey, I love that game, but it wasn't perfect. First, while the lore was rich, deep and expansive, and the plot was pushed forward by the main character's motivation, as it should be with every story, this motivation wasn't exactly powerful in the original game. Being a watcher and embarking upon a journey to figure out what happened to you that fateful day at the Ingwithan ruins felt almost like a first world problem compared to, I don't know, the anxiety of some guy who wakes up in an unknown terrifying place and almost immediately learns that he's being consumed by some demonic entity who also happens to be some sinister creature of prophecy who everyone and their mom want to kill? Yeah, we might be talking about this one later on. But in the White March Part 2, you get some proper stakes. You know, of the holy shit if we don't stop these things the world will end kind. Which is exactly what we expect from a medieval fantasy game worth its salt. This world ending threat is also wrapped in a veneer of mystery that is unveiled at just the right pace. Which is also something the original game didn't exactly nail, especially in its third act. And these revelations are properly earned by the player as he or she pushes forward and dives deeper into the story. Which is something not every game gets right. The mystery in this game is not forcefully kept a mystery till the very end and revealed all at once in a very clumsy way, as it happens in this other game that we may or may not be talking about later on. Second, the original game had factions whose favor you could earn at the cost of incurring the the wrath of some other faction, but their importance was painfully trivial and it boiled down to, who do I want to lend a hand in the battle to defend my stronghold? The White March Part 2 DLC also has factions and they are people who have a personal stake in the matter. If the shit hits the fan, they'll be the first ones to perish, and if you earn their favor, they'll reward you with little boons that are going to come in handy in battle. Also, in the original game, your companion's skills and talents and even your own were somewhat underutilized in story-related scripted events. The White March Part 2 makes your skills and those of your companions crucial to story-related events, and the way in which things may turn out in the end greatly vary depending on who does what and even on the items that you have in your inventory at the time. If Obsidian had had a few more hundred thousand dollars, and that's one big if, this expansion pack could have easily made it to the top five of this list, but as it is, I still think it's the best DLC amongst both Pillars games. 8. The Old Hunters, Bloodborne Bloodborne was already notoriously terrifying, brooding, and tough as nails, but nothing you experienced in the core game could prepare you for what was to come in the DLC. It was not only disturbing as fuck in ways that were actually quite impressive, but it also came packed with, in my opinion, the toughest real-time fight in modern gaming. Yes, this motherfucker was both incredibly off-putting and ridiculously hard, at least for some clumsy old fuck such as myself. Every location in Bloodborne is a sight to behold, and the old hunters came with more. Every boss in this game is a love letter to art itself and gameplay design, and this DLC brought more. And it even brought more of those summonable spirits who lend a hand, which are a bit of a trademark of the Soulsborne games. Even if this type of ARPG isn't exactly my jam, this DLC deserves a bad motherfucker's seal of approval. Expedition Underrail Another textbook case of a DLC made by people who understand what expansion packs are all about. Underrail's plot heavily relied on the mystery behind the faceless invasion as a carrot on a stick for the player to go from plot point to plot point. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. But the DLC takes this to the next freaking level. We're talking X-Files levels of intrigue and anxiety. Also, the writing in the original game was a bit of a hit or miss deal. Some characters were ready to reveal their most obscure motivations to a complete stranger for no reason. There were homicidal characters and other wackos giving away their psychopathic tendencies within the first minute of conversation, but you can tell that shit got serious the minute you talk to this guy in the docks of Core City, the guy who ushers in the DLC content. This truly is a quantum leap in writing quality, and it's not limited to just the dialogues. The main mission the threat that you are up against and the various groups of people who coexist in the Black Sea feel more relevant, mysterious, and dangerous than anything you had encountered up until that moment. The exploration aspect of the game, which was already great, is taken to the next level here, as is combat and questing. This DLC also introduced jet skis, which were an absolute blast, and a new skill branch which quickly became my favorite. All in all, a very impressive DLC for a very impressive game. 6. Awakening Dragon Age Origins Let's get this out of the way. Talking Darkspawn? It is talking! That should have never happened. 
and if you couldn't squeeze a better idea out of your brain to make the darkspawn come off as a sentient race, divided into warring bands, each with their own agendas, you should have definitely put a heck of a lot more effort into the voice acting and dialogue lines. Soon, they will go to Vigil's keep as well. The mother, she wants the keep destroyed utterly. <sighs> the darkspawn has a point. <laughs> Also, the cheese factor is taking a little bit too far. Thankfully, this is the type of cheese that I like. But now that that's out of the way, I have to say this expansion pack is a nice little pill that condenses everything that was great about the original game, and it improves upon it in many ways. You have the rune crafting profession, which is an absolute blast. You have a broad array of new skills for each combat discipline, and you have badass loot that puts to shame most of the best items you find in the core game. But the best thing about this DLC is how your choices, especially those you make near the end, have a significant impact on how things play out, and it goes beyond the recollection of events that you get in the end with the customary succession of stills. Dragon Age Origins is one of my favorite games of all time, but I felt like, on the gameplay end of things, it was just one millimeter short of striking the perfect balance between scripted dialogues and cinematic cutscenes on one scale and player agency on the other. For example, in the original game, you had the Lance Meet event, which was a pivotal moment in the story. And I find it mind-blowing that things can play out in so many different ways here, and there's dialogue lines, animations, and entire cutscenes to account for every possible outcome. But after the lands meet, regardless of how things end up playing out, you have to go to Redcliffe and then you have to go back to Denerim to face the Darkspawn in an epic final showdown. But in Awakening, after that point of no return in the story, you are given the choice to stay and fight to defend your stronghold along your comrades in arms, in one of the most epic hold the line moments in the history of gaming, or you can go and try to save the city of Amaranthine. And this decision has major consequences. You can also choose to side with the architect, or have your party take on the mother without his help. You can take this or that companion along for the ride and leave these or those others to defend your stronghold. And the game acknowledges your decisions in all these instances and presents you with a proper outcome. This DLC also features awesome locations in the tradition of the original game, and it also has awesome boss fights and extra content for those who are obsessive completionists. I know this DLC is sprinkled with some cheese and cringe, but the fun factor and replay value here are just too damn high! 5. Shore Leave, Mass Effect 3 Man, these guys just couldn't stop putting out DLCs for this series. And to be fair, all of them had something to offer that just wasn't there in the core game. The Lair of the Shadow Broker, for example, brought some proper boss fights to a game that had almost none. It also dared to introduce a new game mechanic and a new variety of combat situations. But it also featured the worst writing in the entire saga and a retconned Liara that just didn't work despite the game's best efforts to sell you that much has happened in the last two years. Then you had Project Overlord, which was a serious contender for this spot on the list. It featured the best writing in the entire game, it had the most interesting antagonist, the most thought-provoking story, and even introduced a very realistic moral dilemma. Unfortunately, it also featured clunky vehicle platforming that nobody asked for, 100% reutilized enemies, and tedious action sequences aboard your flimsy M44 hammerhead. Oh, come on! The M44 hammerhead is vastly superior! Come on, that thing's made of tissue paper. At least the Mako can take a few hits. Yep, I'll have to agree with Jimmy on this one. Then you had the Arrival DLC for those who craved a challenge and an explanation about how the Reapers managed to brainwash people into becoming agents of their own destruction. But unfortunately, this explanation is clumsy and it raises more questions than it answers. Then the third game in the saga had the From Ashes DLC which elaborated further upon the Protheans and their demise at the hands of the Reapers and introduced an interesting companion with a fully fleshed out story and a cutscene that changed one of the most important moments in the game for the better. But other than that, it was nothing to write home about. The Omega DLC added some pretty decent action and enemies, and it was also a dream come true for those Arya Talok simps. The villain was a walking cliché though, and the game added nothing to the core game's narrative or lore. The Leviathan DLC added a plausible origin story for the Reapers and provided further insight into their motivations. It was pretty decent content from the narrative standpoint, and they should have absolutely used it as the turnstone for a complete rewrite of the saga's hideous ending. 
which spoiler alert, they chose not to do. But despite its solid action and its new enemies, the questing in this game was terribly designed and tedious, and because Bioware didn't bother to rewrite anything in the game, like they did with that little scene in Thessia when they put out the From Ashes DLC, everything that happens in this DLC ends up going nowhere. Uh, did you play the extended cut ending DLC? Yes, I did. And it made the ending a little bit less shitty, but it was still shitty. And then you have the one DLC that actually made it to the list. Surely focuses on the best thing about the entire saga, your companions. Yes, the amount of cheese is too damn high, but by the time you play this DLC for the first time, these guys and gals and aliens will feel more like a family than some of your actual relatives. Bioware wasn't afraid to throw this giant wheel of cheese at us because they 100% knew we were going to love it, and we did. We laughed out loud with Morden's recordings, cried with Femshep as she watched Thane's video, and at his memorial service. This is how this DLC ended for me. Over. At least we threw one hell of a party. Probably the last one. No. No matter what happens, you'll find a way to do what's right. For all of us. Serving on a human ship. I never would have guessed. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Ah. A good ride. <laughs> the best. And after all you've been through with these people, especially if you decided to romance Tally, it doesn't get more emotional and fulfilling than this. This game also throws Gravitas out the window in favor of a lighthearted and daring adventure that is a love letter to the saga's fans. Remember this trivial comedic relief moment? Oh, it, it, it's no trouble, Commander. I'm sure you have larger concerns. We can put in a requisition order. My toothbrush is a Scission Promark 4. It uses tiny mass effect fields to break up plaque and massage the gums. It costs 6,000 credits. Okay, yeah, you're on your own with that. Well, I find it brilliantly cheesy, or cheesily brilliant that the damn toothbrush ends up saving the entire galaxy if you think of it. Shoreleaf also introduces an arena challenge that is an entire game within a game, and that is more addictive than the entire saga itself. I absolutely loved everything about it, the way they introduced challenges in a lore consistent way, the different arenas and sponsors, the enemy variety, the weapons and armor sets that you can get as rewards for beating some of its encounters, and that you can later use in the game. You can tell the developers put passion and hard work into this one, and it paid off immensely. 4. Heart of Winter, Icewind Dale This expansion pack beat the crap out of my every expectation, and that's probably why it is so high on this list. To tell the truth, I was never really crazy about the core game. The fact that you could create your entire party from scratch however you wished, the tactically challenging, tough as nails combat encounters, and the extremely awesome musical score never made up for the clumsy storytelling, the vacuous characters, or the railroady design. So back in the day, I totally skipped this one. And I am glad I gave it a chance when I played the Enhanced Edition a couple of years ago. This expansion has everything I thought was lacking in the original. The plot is the result of characters pursuing their goals and following their motivations, and you can't help but respect and even empathize with everyone here, including the main antagonist. The action is also tight and challenging, and to top things off you have the Trials of the Lure Master, which is a DLC within a DLC that has the best exploration, quest design, and combat encounters in the entire saga. This is some of the best D&D content out there, and it's worth checking out even if you didn't like the core game all that much. The good news is that this is a standalone expansion, so happy hunting. I made a video about it just in case you want to know more. I'll leave a link to it in the description section down below. 3. Dark Arisen, Dragon's Dogma I told you I was going to cheat, although this isn't technically cheating, 
Well, not entirely. Dragon's Dogma came out in the year 2012 originally, and Dark Arisen was indeed an expansion pack, although we got that content with a remastered edition that came out in the year 2016 with the name Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. In addition to the overrated Eternal Furry Stone, which cheapened the adventure aspect of the game immensely, uh, if you don't like it, you can always not use it. Yeah, shut up, okay? Well, in addition to that, we got several new cool items and the Bitter Black Isle region. And this is hands down my favorite expansion mission and location in the history of gaming. The feeling of adventure is just too damn high with this one. To me, the descent into the depths of Light Town is where Dark Souls truly shone. It was my favorite region because it genuinely made me feel like there was a lot to lose if I failed. It was a descent into the unknown through dimly lit passageways where danger lurked around every corner. And Bitter Black Isle in Dragon's Dogma felt like Blight Town in steroids. The level design was on par, if not better than the one we got in games like Dark Souls or Bloodborne. It was one huge non-linear map that was both a joy and a horror to explore. The place felt genuinely dangerous. There were dark narrow corridors that somehow led to huge underground grottoes, abandoned citadels and harrowing dungeons. You could easily fall to your death in almost every area. You could meet death itself and it could one-shot you or take your companion's life for good if you weren't careful. There were Cyclops the size of fucking buildings, oversized Eye of the Beholder inspired bosses, and more importantly, fast travel was a precious commodity that you could only achieve by means of lifestones, a consumable item that was very hard to come by. Also, the game was filled with enemies who felt like mini-bosses because they actually challenged your tactical skills in addition to your button mashing talent. Exploration, lengthy combat encounters, and the overall feeling of adventure were always Dragon's Dogma's main warhorses, and this expansion pack, or additional content in the remastered edition, however you want to see it, took all those things that made Dragon's Dogma great and cranked them up to 11 or 12, and it also managed to sweep all those things that suck about the game under the rug. The main quest here is kept streamlined and to the point. There's almost no dialogue or interactions with other NPCs, thank the maker. And this time your enemies seem to scale a little bit more consistently than in the core game. And of course, the sound effects and mix, which were always absolutely killer in the core game, are still amazing. Two. There aren't any! I'm sorry, what? One. Mask of the Betrayer. Neverwinter Nights 2. Who would have thought that a decent D&D game with serviceable combat, hit and miss writing, truckloads of cliches, and a lot of user experience issues would get the best expansion pack in the history of D&D video games? D&D lore is vast and expansive, more than any other lore in entertainment, I think. But some say that D&D video games have never fully lived up to the brand's narrative potential, and some say this is because its video games tend to rely a little too heavily on D&D's campier and goofier side. Go figure. But not Mask of the Betrayer. This is one of the best medieval fantasy stories ever told. It's a journey through dimensions that has you raising against time, standing your ground against gods, and taking the fight to their realms. It's the story of the evil that lives within us, like a gnarled root which is constantly chipping away at our soul and demanding that we appease it by turning others into our victims. It conveys the moral that sacrifice is the true measure of love, delivered to us through the tale of a priest who had to decide between faith and love because he couldn't serve both, or through the story of a hag who had to choose between her son and her coven of hags because she couldn't have both. But Mask of the Betrayer is not only about its story, lore, and the delicious subtext. Combat in this expansion pack is significantly harder than it was in the core game. Companions are infinitely more interesting and memorable, and the final stretch of the game is a tour de force of action that strikes the perfect balance between player agency and structured narrative. This is a fucking masterpiece, however you look at it. Yes, even if the spirit eater mechanic gets on your nerves from time to time. Also one, Blood and Wine, The Witcher 3. I don't think I've ever said this on this channel, because I also don't think I've ever felt this way about an expansion pack, but here it goes. I just can't believe how good this game is. You know, most audiovisual adaptations of stories that were originally told in books try to be as faithful as they can to the original material. The good ones, I mean. The Witcher games, however, have always been very ballsy. Rather than telling the exact same story we got in the books, 
they used the Witcher's lore as conceived by Andrei Sapkowski to bring us new tales that serve to further enrich the existing narrative in the books. Sure, the cost is that sometimes in the games we go to places and meet characters that Geralt is already familiar with, and we have no idea when or why he's been to these places, how he met these people, or how well acquainted he is with any of them. And sometimes this is a little too hard to piece together from the context. And although the books came first, there are also a few things in them that seem to lack a little bit of context. Like Philippa's and Dijkstra's relationship, or Regis's backstory, or Meeves and Demovan's friendship. And I like how the books and the games come together in a fascinating and deeply immersive cohesive whole. And the blood and wine expansion for The Witcher 3 is the cherry on the top. AAA games aren't known for putting the player in the driver's seat of the experience. You can play The Last of Us, Mafia, or any of the Uncharted games as much as you want, but the story is always going to turn out exactly the same. Hell, even many of the games that take pride in their sandboxy mechanics and open world design still funnel you into a succession of preordained plot points that don't give a rat's ass about what you do between them or how. Isometric RPGs like Arcanum or more recently Underrail were truly first and foremost all about giving their players a great deal of freedom to tackle the game's challenges however they wanted or however they could. Freedom in Tyranny took the form of an impressive myriad of branching paths of decision notes that turned character agency into player agency. But as impressive as these games were, a carefully designed decision tree and some solid tech snippets and perhaps some voice acting was all they needed to pull it off because that's a good enough reward for those of us who play isometric CRPGs. But AAA developers don't like this design, because a story that forks into a myriad of paths is a story that only presents some of its events to the player. Those events he or she chooses to experience. But AAA games are like, Do you know how much we paid for these animations, special effects, and voice acting? Go back to your room and don't come out until you've watched every last one of them, bitch. Not blood and wine, though. This game has balls. This second expansion pack for The Witcher 3 is filled with narrative possibilities and every decision you make in this game steers the ship towards a new course. Even little things like simping for Anna and Rieta's sister Sylvia Anna may change your perspective on very important decision notes that take place later in the story. There are places, huge places, that you may or may not end up going to depending on your decisions. You may or may not have to fight the final boss depending on your decisions. Hell, you may even get imprisoned by the end of the game if you don't play your cards right. Or if you do, depending on how you see things. And because this is a high production 3D game, the consequences of your actions do not play out in a tiny text window. There are cutscenes with dialogue and action that take place in detailed locations. In my opinion, this is it. This is the real score when it comes to the balance between immersive high quality production values and player agency. But it doesn't stop there. Quests in The Witcher 3 are some of the best quests I've ever experienced in a video game. And even this aspect of the game is taken to the next level. Side quests in Blood and Wine are exciting, creative, rife with easter eggs and perils of wisdom. And they take place in exquisitely designed locations like you had never seen before by that time. And speaking of locations, just walking about the city of Boucler is worth the price of the admission. The place is huge and intricate and it makes you feel like you're walking the streets of Orleans and the square of Matroa and it's alive and busy with city dwellers and merchants and they actually have useful stuff to sell and even quests to give. This city feels like a place that you can spend weeks in before you know even half of it. A fairly large chunk of the last book in the Witcher series, The Lady of the Lake, takes place in Tucson and I can tell you the city and the game pretty much beat the sod out of how I imagined it, telling by its description in the book. It truly makes you want to fight to preserve it when all hell breaks loose when the vampires attack. And it's not just the city of Boucler that's awesome. The Mandragora Art Club, in which Geralt has his little rendezvous with Anna and Rieta, looks like a place I'd like to hang out with Triz. Your vineyard, which is your house in this game, and that's right, you finally get your own place. And it's a jaw-dropping estate that'll make you want to jump into the game and live there for the rest of your life. And it's not there just for show. There are plenty of services that you can use there and things that you can do. And also a couple of quests or three to make you feel like you've earned living there. And if you play your cards right, this is where the game will finally make all the things that you have worked so hard for over the course of these three games 
on a personal level that is, come full circle in the most satisfying way imaginable. The characters are also brilliant, from your friend Regis, to the game's main antagonist Detloff, to the mysterious Oriana, which is my favorite character in this expansion by the way, to Anna and Rieta and her sister, hell even Dandelion has some of his best moments here. There was not a single moment in the story in this expansion pack in which I felt like the plot was dragging the characters. Everything in this story happened because someone needed or wanted to do something, and they all had rock solid motivations for what they were doing at all times. And if you liked Gwent, know that this is the expansion pack that introduced the Skellige faction that became so popular later in Thronebreaker and Gwent Online, and there's even a new tourney for you to play. Also the pace of the story and the action is masterful and the final stretch of the game is one of the best ever in every respect. Blood and Wine is a timeless masterpiece and probably the last truly great AAA RPG we're ever going to get. After I was done playing it for the second time, I got this feeling like AAA titles as a whole had bid farewell to all of us RPG fans in Truman Show fashion achieving the highest possible rating for the show, but also bringing it to an end. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, thank you for watching all the way up until now. If you like what you are seeing on this channel, please consider subscribing and clicking that notification bell to avoid the usual YouTube shenanigans. Share the video, but most importantly, never stop gaming. But don't let gaming get in the way of your hopes and dreams. Bye, everyone.